Live Chats. I'm Troy Peters, Yosa Music Director, and so delighted to have you all with us today, and especially happy to be joined by Miguel Harth Bedoya. Miguel has been the music director of the Fort Worth Symphony now for 20 years, and I believe is wrapping up his tenure there. He's also been the chief conductor of the Norwegian Radio Orchestra for seven years, and this fall, he, was, he will be the new director of orchestral studies at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. He also has uh, created the Conducting Institute, a summer orchestral conducting program with a variety of online courses. And he's a very busy guest conductor. He's worked with many of the greatest orchestras here in the United States and around the world. So Miguel, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you with us. My pleasure. So you and I both live in Texas now, but we're not native te Texans. As they say, we're not from Texas, but we got here as fast as we could. Um, in your case, uh, you're Peruvian. So what is the journey that led you to music? How did you fall in love with classical music and what made you decide to become a conductor? Well, first of all, it's great being here with, at your platform and with all your students, members of orchestras and public at large, because now having these options at hand, you know, we can reach, we can touch, you know, so many, so many people's lives through music. As a matter of fact, I'm wearing here my t-shirt that it's the motto for the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra, you know, life is better with music. And we've had this for over a decade now, and it's true, life is better with music. But to your question, I'm originally from Lima, Peru, where I did my, my high school studies. And in looking back, I just had a normal life. In other words, I went to school, I finished school, and I played soccer every single day of my life across the street in the park with kids from the neighborhood. Now, I grew up in a musical family, but we didn't have the music that, that I do now. We just had folk music, Latin American music, maybe Spanish music. My sister picked up the guitar. I was assigned the piano because you don't even remember when you started because suddenly you are doing this and then the violin. And, and these are functional matters. In other words, you have an instrument to make music. You don't have an instrument to just have lessons or study works of music. I never studied a, a piece of music. If I look back, never studied Mozart Sonata or Haydn, but I knew how to make music on the keyboard or on percussion instruments as well, or you would sing and dance. That was part of it. So, I mean, most of Latin American countries have music in, in their veins, but it was around 15 years of age, 16 years of age. And my mom is a freelance musician, a contractor as well. So she was in charge of hiring the choir for the opera company in Lima, which was a three month season. And I was just helping her out. The same as the way I helped her in her gigs, you know, weddings, receptions, funerals, I mean, everything. My initial conductings were in those settings actually. So, and I got a job at the opera theater as backstage crew. And I was just fascinating while doing my work, moving chairs, cleaning up stuff, pulling the curtains, you know, everything that, you know, you were an extra pair of hands for anything. The music, most of it Italian operas was resonating around, you know, for this is weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. So I finished school at about 2 p.m. and 3 to midnight. That, that was my, you know, for three months, that was my routine. So if I had not had this encounter with music from the behind the scenes, I probably wouldn't be doing what I do now because I'm not good as a pianist, as a violinist, as a singer, is nothing. So a combination of process of elimination. And back, this is in the 80s now when I'm finishing high school. This is last century, guys, last century. We're from, yeah, we're dinosaurs. Then we didn't have a music school to study professionally. So I was stuck. In other words, I had a big dilemma to tell my mother, single mother family, said, I want to study this because I want to be that guy, the person there conducting who has the best seat in the house and knows languages and instruments and all of this. So, but that's a dilemma because you cannot study that in the whole country. So first dilemma is you have to go somewhere else. So to make the story short, I went to the closest country to Peru, which is Chile. We had much more activity. And there upon arrival, I met with my wife now. So this is, you know, 30 some years ago, but also they pointed out to me that I couldn't study in Chile either. So that's where I found about the existence of the Curtis Institute of Music, 
I never heard of the Curtis Institute of Music or the Juilliard School, which I ended up studying later during my days as a student in Peru. So to me, the path was not, there's a conductor, I wanna do what that person does, it's in the Bernstein, the Karajans, the Abado, because I didn't know about them. It was just the music for the music itself and being the, the person who had, who could connect all the dots, the music, the lyrics, the singers, the staging, that was fascinating to me. And then, so I set foot at Curtis and took the audition at Curtis and that's when we met. So because of Vinicio, actually, because of Vinicio Messer, you, yeah, exactly. So that, that's what it was. It was just the love of music, but the unknown. In other words, the unknown didn't frighten me. Oh, I don't know what it's going to be. Am I going to get a job? I never thought about that. Even to this date, I think we love music or we don't do it. Music is not a fallback. Oh, if it doesn't go well in law school, well, I'll just be a musician. It doesn't work like that, you know. So, and it, I mean, there's not one single day that I wouldn't think twice of doing something else. So I would recommend strongly to everybody to do whatever you feel doing. And most likely you'll succeed at something that, that you like. That's a huge leap to go from, I'm in Peru and I'm playing music. I'm a, a, a young man who's finding my way on the violin and the, piano, um, falling in love at the opera house with, with what goes on to getting into one of the best conservatories in the world. And I, I, I know there must have been to some degree, just a, a natural resonance for you with, with being a conductor. But nonetheless, how did you prepare yourself? How did you find your way to polishing your skill enough to get into someplace like Curtis? coming well, from the, the background that you've sure. described. Yeah, and I never had a theory, music theory class ever in my life by, by that point. So as I finished high school, I met up with a composer who passed away recently at age 101, Enrique Turriaga, who then had already retired from teaching. And I ended up in, into his hands by, just by asking, I always ask. And I mean, we have to remind, the younger generation that the world existed without internet, without iPhones, without email. So you actually had to go and do something in person or you had to read a book if you, or a phone book, you know, those things existed if you needed something. So the, the, the lack of availability of information is what drove me to find what, what I, you know, one person would lead me to another one. So Enrique Torriaga said, ah, you really want to do this. And Torriaga studied with Honegger you know, in, I think in the, well, 30s, before the, before the, before the Second World War. And he said, are you sure you want to do this? Well, you know, I'm assuming that like composers, conductors need to know what composers know, which is, you know, at least harmony, counterpoint, fugue, da, 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 and I'm looking at this list in mental list, instrumentation, all of that, you know, and when do you want to do this? I said, I don't know, because at that point I didn't know when, how. So, but when I came across Curtis, the brochure was very simple. Then it may still be the same because it never changed for nearly hundred years. The, the instructions for the application were there. You know, you need to be able to read a Bach chorale in four clef at the keyboard. You must be able to know this. You have to choose or you must be able to conduct the right of spring or stuff like that, you know, but it said, it was very clear. You have to have a good sense of musicianship, which is very hard to define. And so I followed those things and it took me about nine months to prepare to that list with the help of, of him. And then the help of my wife, because my wife had just finished her studies in theory and was studying choral conductance. So she's the one who, who told me, have you ever done dictation? Like, what is that? I never ever encountered that. So she really took me by the hand and, and, and this composer. So that, that was it, I had guidance. So in looking back, that's what I've sort of been fascinated by, it's guidance. We conductors or, or teachers, we need to guide the younger generations. We, we cannot just give information. And so that's how it was. And then I showed up at Curtis. Well, first of all, I worked for those nine months to save money because an airfare from Peru to the States was something quite costly and, and so on and so forth. And then I met who was my, my teacher, Otto Werner Mueller, who was very puzzled about me. So why, why, 
who are you in, in the sense of you know where do you come from and how come do you know so little you know because he did say you know you know so he says well i haven't studied anything i've just done music i've done all these things and and for instance one of the most puzzling thing at that particular audition was then he said go to the piano I said, oh, okay. then he put a score and now i know that it was the first song of schubert's winterreise but then i'd never seen this before but a piano part and a song and in, in within a few seconds i'm thinking oh if he's going to ask me to play this this is actually easy it's in d minor it's, 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 i can i can do this you know before i could even finish that thought he said uh, young man please play this but a minor third above <laughs> and then i realized hang on hang on hang on how do i do this i have done this in the sense that when i was in my teens I could read music somehow, but then I got, I did a few gigs playing at tea parties, you know, for some ladies who needed somebody to, to play songs, boleros, who knows, whatever, arias. And they would bring sheet music to the piano and they were instructed to say, please play this in E. They didn't know what it meant, but the, the sheet of music was in another key. So I was used to, oh, play this for me in that key. And I'm thinking, oh, this is, I've done this. I've done this. I can do this. So I, I figured out from a different angle how to get through this, this test. Still, obviously, not all of it was right. And also, I didn't speak English. So that was something else. You know, I spoke four other languages, but none of them were English. And so <laughs> it was fascinating. I mean, it, it still only tells me that if anybody has the, the drive, you know, to conquer something, it's, it's totally doable because I had all the chances, all the odds were against, you know, against me. Well, and I, I mean, I remember well, Miguel, when we first met, um, and just for the sake of listeners, uh, just through an interesting coincidence, um, Miguel ended up, when he came to Curtis, moving into the same place where I had lived the previous year. And so he essentially inherited my apartment or my, my room in this mm -hmm. house. And, um, and so we had this special little bond of just, you know, I knew how the funny faucet in the sink worked or those kinds of things, you know. And, and um, so we talked a little bit in those days. And I remember vividly feeling like you and I both came to that school with less fluency in the world of, the, of classical music than some of our classmates. We had classmates whose parents were soloists or whose parents played in the New York Philharmonic or the Philadelphia Orchestra. And, and you and I and, and many others came from families where we, we weren't in that same, in that same uh, demi-monde mm -hmm. before we arrived there. Um, what was that like for you? And, and what, well, what advice would you give of how do you acquire fluency when you're going into into a, a cultural world because of course then you moved to Oregon and you moved to Texas and you've gone and you started working in Norway and how do you um, acclimate as a musician as a, and as a person to a new world when you when you travel and, and take on new parts of your life well I think it's it's personal. I don't think it's anything to do with my training necessarily, either in in high school or primary school or college. I think it's it's just very personal. I find myself quite content where I am with what I have, even to this day. You know, uh, we have three children, and one is going to university now, and so the pandemic reminded me, oh. I have less, I can live with less. You know, I do less, I can be happy with. In other words, I never think of what I don't have and moan about it or whine about it. You know, what's, what's the point, first of all? So, and I don't know why. I, I don't expect everybody to, to be, be like that. But I think that absolutely everything has a positive and a negative. You can just choose which one you want to look. I like this because it's red. I don't like it because it's red. There you go. So, simple. So that has never troubled me, particularly the unknown. You know, I'm a, I'm a very curious person. I like reading a lot, anything. I prefer much more reading instructions than getting a tutorial on, on YouTube, honestly, because the other one goes too fast goes, or goes too slow. So reading goes to my own pace. It, it, I mean, you remember, you know, Otto Werner Mueller, one of the scariest looking individuals, you know, huge 
tall German. He would scream and he was not scary at all to me. In my first lesson, my first lab orchestra lesson, and we're talking who were, who, yeah, who were the members of the lab orchestra, right? Pam Frank, Josh Smith, who's the principal flute in the Cleveland Orchestra. I mean, Danny Matsukawa, who's principal bassoon in Philadelphia. These were, and, and we were, we were nothing, right? We were starting from nothing. And Otto Werner Mueller just screamed at me and said, young man, you might think you have talent, but about this music, which was German music, you know nothing. And I said, sure. <laughs> yeah, if you say so, why would I know, right? Why would I know? And that took him off of guard. And, and I said, well, would you, are you willing to take me through that? And so I did end up studying five years with him, you know, longer than, than many others. So, because he was right. So I, I also know what I don't know about anything. You know, I, I never would have an opinion on a matter that I have no idea. Why should I know more than somebody else? So that, but the curiosity of overcoming that lack of knowledge. Now, mind you, I don't need to know everything either. You know, I don't, what I say, I don't ponder in the irrelevant. To me, if it's irrelevant, well, it's gone. So I, I don't know what it is, but I, I, I keep myself quite engaged on this, doing this. I'm not a maniac of one or the other thing. Because there are two things that I don't negotiate every day of my life. Get ready. Number one, sleep every single day. Sleep whatever your body needs, whatever your body tells you. Ten hours, five hours, I don't know. You cannot put off that for I'll sleep at the end of the month. You might, but anyway. So I, I keep that every day. And then eating, eating habits whatever it's good, for, it's good for you, you should, you should do it. So I, I know what is good and has been changing over time. And the other one is, is moving. In other words, now that the, the thing I miss the most in, in, yes, it's the music making with my colleagues and, and sharing music with the audience, but personally, physically, I don't move. I've, I've not been moving, mind you, we move four or five hours a day in addition to walking and exercising and playing tennis. So right now, that's the one thing I haven't discovered because it won't be the same energy even if I wave my arms pretending that I'm moving because I'm not moving. So that part, I cannot replace it literally. So, but that's how it goes. I just keep finding what it is that, you know, that I can be of use and happy with. Fabulous. Um, one of our students, David Escamilla says, Hola Miguel, um, tocas algún instrumento and pardon my Spanish, which is terrible. So do you play any instruments? And you spoke earlier about uh, time on the piano, time on the violin. Yes. But do you play any instruments? Well, the, the, there is the, the definition of playing and what I call maneuvering an instrument. So I do not play an instrument anymore because I have respect for the people that practice and spend it like you probably I don't know what instrument you might play now that's playing and I can never say I play the piano or the violin because uh, that's not what I do anymore but I call it I maneuver the keyboard so if you put a piece on the piano and maybe a piano reduction or a concerto so yes I can make it work for a bit but I would never consider that playing same with the violin I mean the, the mark is gone already I stopped playing at age 15 so I don't want to pretend so, but I, yes, I maneuver several instruments that help me to be efficient as a conductor, including brass instruments, the harp, percussion, and, and so on and so forth. And do you, um, do you, do you, are your children musicians, your own family? Okay, we have an 18 year old, 15 year old, and almost 14 year old, so girl, boy, girl. And we have a domestic agreement all from the beginning. One sport, one instrument, whatever it is, doesn't matter. You can switch the back and forth, you can do because I, I do believe that one thing doesn't take the other way. If anything, it complements each other. You know, academics is a particular path, but when you add music, it's more than proven that people that handle music can see and figure out things differently. Like memory, for instance, it's so much harder to memorize music than data. You know, data equations, it, it goes back, but music. So that's how we started, you know. And, you know, I played soccer and I, again, played some instrument at some point, somehow, all the time. And our kids have gone from violin to piano to choir. Our middle son plays the cello only. The youngest has gone from violin to piano to choir. We can't voice definitely as an instrument, but by all means. And then sports, the same. They've changed from tennis 
to sports that I had no idea existed, like lacrosse or, 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 or baseball. I mean, I knew it existed, but I'd never been to a baseball game in my life. Funnily enough, I've pitched for the Rangers, right? Ironically, and I had no clue what the game was about. So we have learned as parents about games and sports with our children, through our children, you know, sitting there at the, at the bleachers with other parents to realize that something goes and suddenly, ah, everybody's screaming, what happened? <laughs> what just happened? You know, so, but I use the same analogy to invite people to learn about music the same way. You know, if you open up yourself to something that you don't know, it involves community participation, then it should be equal. So that's, that's in, in long, actually, that's, that's the answer. And it til, still keeps evolving. There's no bargaining on that. It's, it's almost the law in the house. Nice. Now, you have mentioned your own uh, background as a pianist and that you're in your audition being asked to transpose. How important, I, I have a lot of students who are aspiring conductors or uh, band directors, orchestra directors, um, and how important do you think piano skills are in the development of the ability to become a good conductor? Well, I do believe that not just keyboard skill, the piano, keyboard skill, because you can actually learn a lot from a good electric keyboard, electronic keyboard. You know, they're half weighted, full weighted. Sure, it, for the purpose is the same. Even a, a four octave keyboard can do the job. The, the why is that no other instrument that has a keyboard can help you as a conductor understand as many layers as you can have in your hands to prove what you are hearing. The guitar can't do it, the violin, single note instruments, even with multiphonic cannot help you that. So it's part of a skill that definitely, and also it's the easiest one because you see the note and the note is there forever. In the violin, you don't see the note, so that already. So the, the keyboard is the easiest to maneuver not to play. And then string skills you have to have. You have to have string skills somehow at the same level. I, I call it maneuvering a string instrument. Now, I, I do think there are two big differences, you know, the ones that are held up here and the ones that are not, because so you have to understand both of them. And then the next skill, but then I, I would start being more cautious because you can't really know every instrument at this point, because just to learn about embouchure or reeds, it's a science on its own. So something has to, has to go from the practical point of view. So the answer is yes. Yes, but a little more as well. Right, right. And well, and of course, the more knowledge you have, the better off you are in any field, but there's so many circumstances um, even with professional musicians who obviously the, the, your, your oboist in the Norwegian radio orchestra doesn't need advice from you on how to play the oboe. But if you understand more about the mm -hmm. details of his or her work, mm -hmm. you can help that musician succeed more readily, right? You, you can meet that person halfway in, in how you're supporting them and helping them. And more importantly for me, I think you can understand the composer's intentions, right? Oh, absolutely. But le let, me, let me take on one point you have said. You have mentioned about professional conductors. Okay, everybody understands. Professional conductors is, actually it's not, we shouldn't call professional conductors because it's professional something in the sense whether you are remunerated for it or not. But the level of conductors, every orchestra, every orchestra, even some schools, elementary schools have young orchestras, middle school, high schools, college, certainly youth orchestras, civic orchestras, amateur orchestras, all of them deserve a well-trained conductor. There's no reason why anybody should improvise that because if the conductor is director, so you have to give direction. And if you don't have tools to direct people, then you might be you know, sort of tilting the scale in the opposite way of direction. So that's, that's why I acknowledge that the more professional the orchestras are, the easier they can be to deal in a certain way on some issues like te technical matters. But the work that you do, Troy, the work that my teachers, conductors do in, in high school, it's a lot harder, a lot harder. Now, you may not know this, but during my years at Curtis, I taught at San Maria Goretti High School. Yes, an all-girl high school, and I, I was the conductor of the orchestra, 7.30. A.M., that's when orchestra was, 7.30 to 8.23 or something like that. 
freezing cold in winter. I never experienced a winter in my life anyway. So, but then the orchestra is not an orchestra as we know it at Curtis. It's one oboe, 10 flutes, a saxophone, one violin. So now you have to make it sound like an orchestra. So then I realized, oh, I better know more how I can help that group, you know? And, and it was very fortunate to have the friends at school that could either come or help me or give me you know, guidance in how to approach that. And then when I did my master's at the Juilliard School, I was the conductor of the pre-college symphony. So the, the middle age, well, middle age, the, the 12 years or the 13 year olds. And I also was the conductor of the Norwalk Youth Symphony in Connecticut. So completely different makeup of musicians and age ranges and all of that. And after that, my first actually appointment in the US was music director of the New York Youth Symphony. You know, before I could even lead, be, be the head of a professional orchestra. I mean, I was already conducting professional orchestras as a one-time you know, guest, but then you realize that conducting is really making the group that you have in front of you be the best possible during the time that you have with them. That's what a conductor does. The conductor is not there to look good. If you look good while doing it, hey, why not? But you know, you are there to make sure that all members of the orchestra of any age, and I remember those days from youth orchestras, and I still visit youth orchestras here and there, is to make sure that the, the passion that they have and the frustration that they have for the, that passion, because that's what it happens, is taken as, as a positive. You know, it's like running a marathon. The training is brutal. And so is the marathon, but it's less brutal. So we're there to acknowledge that and to make sure that what they are doing is worth it. It's worth it every rehearsal, 20 times of the same thing. Yes, because we know that if it's done well, the rewards will be so much greater than, you know, than the trouble that we're going through, you know, rehearsal after rehearsal. Absolutely. And, and thank you. I mean, it, it absolutely matches my experience. I'm fortunate enough that I get to stand in front of good professional orchestras from time to time and so grateful for the, for the chance to work with the San Antonio Symphony and the Vermont Symphony and, and others and mm -hmm. love my colleagues in those jobs. And I'm especially grateful that usually that work is easier than the work I do with my youth orchestra. I love working with the Yosef Philharmonic and you guys play beautifully and it is a joy to stand in front of you but sometimes we have to climb that mountain a little more than, than professional colleagues do. And, and, um, but at the same time, there are different challenges with a professional orchestra. And some of them are on the podium and many of them are off the podium. And, uh, true, true. Well, if you picture an iceberg, which is slippery, the underneath, the surface of the water is huge. So that's when we, that's when we all spend the most of the time, all of us, including members of YOSA, absolutely. Now, if you have more practice, how to get above the surface in a slippery surface, it's all, all slippery regardless. So then you emerge and then you, if you have the ability to stay up there longer, it doesn't mean it's easier. You have figured out how to do it. But if you don't pay attention, you slip and go back down there and you have to start again. So there is no guarantee in what we do because live music is, that is life it only happens now and it's not perfect i've never had a perfect performance and i don't want to have a perfect performance i'd rather have a musical performance than a perfect performance depending on how you look at it but music is a constant journey constant constant if you think you made it through the first concert and you're done then you've missed the point actually of, of why we're doing what we're doing it's the unknown it would be the same as Who's your local team in any any sports? San Antonio Spurs. True. So, what? Who are your rivals? It's in uh, Houston Rockets. Exactly. Okay. So, exactly. You're you're. Yeah, we have the north ones here. You know, for us, it's up up here. Right. So, you still go to play each other year after year after year after year, and you could say, well, I already saw them play. Yeah, but every time is different. Right. Every time, and it's exactly the same game. So, music should be kept like that. And to beat yourself as an artist, as a performer, gets harder. I, I don't know if, if any of you that is listening here has anybody that is a professional athlete or, or is doing 
affiliated sports man, sports person, in which the dedication that they would have to beat one second of the rec one second of their past record takes a million times one second. And the same is for us musicians. Once we conquer a piece of music, the next one is going to be harder, easier on one end, but it's going to be harder because we are more, what's the word? Not, not, which is, which is one to beat our own record. That's the way I can, I, I, the best way I can put it. I want to be better than my last time. And it's, and that's how it should be. Absolutely. Now you've created this wonderful program called the Conducting Institute, a uh, summer orchestral program and online courses. And of course in the current pandemic, uh, even more online activity is going on. And can you tell us a little bit more about the Conducting Institute and what led you to put that together and what your goals are? The creating of the Conducting Institute, which is a program of the parent organization called Caminos del Inca which one of its mission is the preservation and the presenting of music from the Americas, not only South America, but the Americas, because I find that this axis north-south has not been given enough attention as the east-west, you know, across Central Europe and then Asia, which is fine, but I find that there's a lot of wealth musically that can be shared. And at the same time, over two decades, I was noticing in the profession, it's in the orchestral industry, that there were less and less better prepared conductors. So I started looking into the how and why did this happen to realize that basically the 21st century has, with a couple of exceptions in, on paper, is not producing undergrad students in conducting, orchestral conducting. I have my undergrad in orchestral conducting, so does James mm -hmm. Conlon. Many in the last century, when conducting studies became studies, because until Ferrara in Italy, Swarovski in, in Vienna, Scherchen in Germany didn't start teaching conducting, conducting was an apprenticeship in which, first of all, the composer was the conductor until it no longer was possible or until the same piece needed to be played twice and the composer couldn't be in two places. So the, the conductor came out as the need to serve the music that somebody had created. So in looking back to all these issues, I realized that in the US where we have over 1500 registered orchestras at the League of American Orchestras, which there are many, many more, this is excluding colleges and schools. I realized that we need a lot of conductors, not only main conductor, assistant conductor, second conductor, and where are we training them? We're not training them. So somehow the formula went to, I start at a master's degree. That's when I start studying conducting these days in this country, this is the only country, in Finland, in Germany, in Spain, even in Colombia. Why should it be that way? Because now you are studying half the time of an undergrad. Where's the logic? Uh, I know, YouTube conservatory. Sure, the appearance of, I can watch all of this and I got it. No, you got nothing. I mean, if you want to read the score, you still have to read it. So something has happened over time. And I felt, I didn't feel comfortable that my profession was going that way. So instead of me, again, whining and complaining about it, you know, I decided, well, I, 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 should, I should try to see if I can be of help. Because I, I, I wouldn't know that I, I could do it either. You know, I couldn't assume these things. So a few years back, I started doing pilot programs to, to see where a combination of interest and talent and circumstances in different students' life would connect. So to make the story short, I created this institute uh, starting tomorrow for three weeks. It's a, it's a three week, eight hours a day program. And, and unfortunately, the only thing we won't have now is the lab orchestra, but we'll do interactive with previous videos and things like that until we can meet again, is to realize that there are so many gaps and voids that people are skipping through. People are taking shortcuts to get to what appears to be conducting. And, and the ones like us that we're in, we realize that, you know, you're just taking shortcuts. And if you can't read a score, if you can't hear what you're what is being played, if you can't fix intonation, then you can't really be a good conductor at the end. So I started high school level or before, 
honestly. I've had middle school students that just like to sit in to have a sense and sometimes they come back the next year. But normally I address the fundamentals. That's what I, 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 I like learning because once you learn something well, you don't have to relearn it ever. But the opposite applies. If you learn something in anything, if you learn something that is not good, then instead of improving, you regress and you make something worse or, or bad. And then you then you have to undo in order to start again because our, our in, in music, our fields are disciplines that, that are hands-on, that take you know, molding and time practice and, and to reach excellence. So in addressing the fundamentals, I started realizing, well, you know, there's a great need. So now it's not only because I don't define who should be a conductor. Anybody, music educator, band conductor, choral conductor, anybody. I take absolutely anybody that just wants to be a good conductor or improve in what they are doing. But then I've started focusing in, in groups by themselves. This year, I would have taught at Tanglewood, at Boston University Tanglewood Institute, where I've been a regular guest. I would have done a, a camp for high schoolers. And the class was full. We already had 30 line up that would have been in August but then the whole of the the festival got canceled so then I decided well I'm going to do one or two weeks for high schools high school students only and that's coming up later in at the end of June because there there is interest and mind you I have students from Europe that sign up because not even in Europe as a high schoolers you are too young so they'll make you wait so it's a bit of the opposite and then I'm doing a week for music educators whether you are already a teacher whether you are studying music ed, whether you want to study music ed, whether you are a teaching student, anything. So I, I start to you know, focus on, on these groups. And I also will be doing a career transition webinar for kids that are finishing their studies or are thinking whether I should not finish studies or how to audition and how to do this. So it's, it's a good thing that I'm stationary and I haven't conducted any concerts because now I, I can do these things that otherwise I probably would not have the chance to do. But in, in the meantime, I'm preparing the new undergrad program at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, which is really the culmination of these programs. And most likely I will keep these programs as magnets or as way for people to ease into this. I have, I have several juniors and sophomore students that have, I mean, in high school that have written me and contacted me because my, my email is in my website. You know, I've never hidden my email. I call it, there's a gateway. You can always knock, you know, and that they want to know. So if I have one more year of, of high school, what should I be preparing? Great. If you want to think that way, get your AP music theory out of the way because suddenly you have a credit or you can move up and, and invest your time in something else because in the field of conducting, there's so much to study. It's more music than waving your hands. That, that's the easy part. So I'm very excited that, that all of this is somehow, you know, snowballing or domino effect. Or, or just I'm being useful to, to you know, other group of people that before I, I wasn't paying attention to. Well, and for our viewers, you should check out conductinginstitute.com where you can get all of the information on the summer programs. And I've personally been sending out information on the high school camp to some of my students and encouraging oh, them. Thank you. I think it's, it's really exciting. I know when I was in high school, there certainly were not opportunities at the level you're talking about that I was aware of, mm -hmm. um, and it was only later that I became aware of those pathways. Um, we had a question for, actually from one of our staff members, Alex Flores, who wanted to ask you, she, she said, you mentioned that you spoke four languages. What languages are they? And I'm guessing by now it might be more than four languages. Well, I said I, I spoke four languages before I came to the US, right? So Spanish is my native tongue. My mom sent me to the German school. There was just one German school, small school, because my mom studied in, in an all-girls school run by German nuns. And my sister went to that school as well, but there was an all-girls school. So my mom had this, this experience that the German discipline and, and system was, was good and solid. You know, as a single mom, you really need to have this happening. So anyway, I ended up there from kindergarten on realizing that now I'm speaking in German the entire day in school. Absolutely. Everything was taught in German. Whether she knew that or not, it didn't matter. I only had Castilian because we don't speak Spanish. We speak Castilian. That's our language. 
in Castilian, that's in literature, and maybe in the, in the history of Peru. That was it. Everything else was in German. Physics, chemistry, world history, you name it. So now we have to learn a second language because German is your primary language in school. So it started with Italian because way back when not the whole world spoke English, everybody would learn the language of the most adjacent country. So in when well, Latin America, Portuguese would have been you know, the next to, to Peru, which is the only country really in the majority of the Latin American rep, uh, countries that doesn't speak Spanish. So Italian, and that came in handy for the operas later. See, suddenly, oh, I can read Italian, I can follow Italian, and then French, because that's the other adjacent country. So I came to the, and then at the end, we learn a little bit of English, a little bit of English, but I do have to say that learning English from German teachers, nothing sounds like it, nothing. You know, when, yes, all the vowels are different, all the accents are different. So I had to take English as a secondary language. And I had to also go through the TOEFL test as a foreign student. So anyway, when I'm at Curtis, now I have five languages. And then I started studying Russian because there's an, a wealth of music literature in Russian. So not only in Russian, in Cyrillic, so that you have to get to it. So I, and, and I continue studying Russian later through my grad studies at Juilliard and also working with diction coaches because one thing is to know the language, the other one is to apply it for singing. So diction, diction in French, diction in, in, diction in English, my goodness, even for English speaking singers is one of the hardest things to, to do. So anyway, and then of course I speak Norwegian now, which I've you know, learned over time, but from German, it's not so bad. So yeah, it's about what seven languages that I speak in. I, I put myself through Japanese when I went to Japan so that I could at least rehearse in Japanese because again, not everybody speaks English. And why would I speak in English? Maybe I should speak in Castilian, you know? So I, languages is, is like music. You know, it's a way to communicate with people and music is about that. It's communicating with people or sharing something and you know, assuring the music. Are you still composing? I am still composing, okay. and actually one of the upsides for me of the current situation, I mean, you know, there, there are not a lot of upsides, but one of the upsides for me is that I'm working on a choral orchestral piece for the Vermont Symphony that I had been chewing on a little bit, but I'm making a lot more progress uh, right. and finding more time for it. So yes, I'm well, that's that. admirable because I have no talent to create music or to compose music. And we had to take composition classes as conductors. And oh my goodness, my compositions were so terrible as far as the content, you know? So I, I could just see, you know, David Loeb and others going like, oh, you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> yes, it's correct, but it's awful, you know? Okay, well, good to know. I think I even showed <laughs> Ned Rohr in one of my exercises because you have to, you, you have to write music to understand how, how hard it is to write something well. And then the admiration comes even you know, at a higher level that every piece of music is so dedicated. It's somebody took the effort of, of choosing a note, choosing a dynamic. So we, I mean, musicians and, and members of orchestras or chamber music, we should never take for granted that music just shows up there. I mean, it took, took a long, you know, long process. Well, whether long or short, it's that, but it's a deep process of choosing what sounds would come to express something, you know, as the great, German poet Heinrich Heine said, where poetry has its limitations in words, that's when music can continue to express or something along to that line that, you know, there's more than, than words. And so thank you to all composers that we have music. Absolutely. I have one more student question that I wanted to ask. Was David Escamilla had one more question for you. And again, I'm going to, I have studied fewer languages than you have. So I'm going to deploy my rudimentary Spanish and say, ¿Cuál es tu canción favorita que has dirigido? Mm. What's your favorite song that you've conducted before? That's the hardest question. Uh, it's the hardest question. And the, I don't allow myself to have that question for the following reason. The answer is, my favorite piece of music is the one I'm conducting right now. You know why? Because of the people that you are involved with, the orchestra and the audience. Can you imagine? Okay, I'm doing Beethoven's Eighth Symphony as an example. I'm conducting, it's going well. 
you know, guys, this is not my favorite piece. You know, just like, to be honest, yeah, it's okay. The ninth is my favorite, but I have to do this. So like a good actor, you have to fall in love with the role that you're in. Now, having said that, there is one piece of music that to me beats many others. And I've only conducted it a couple of times in my entire 30 plus years of, of professional life. And it's by Italian composer Ruggero Leoncavallo. He, he wrote I Pagliacci, an opera called The Clowns. And it's to me perfect in many sense. First of all, it only lasts maybe 90 minutes. It has an intermission in music. It has the most believable story. In other words, everything is real. So it could be the best movie in life and has one of the most gorgeous tunes that you, you can think. But yet again, my favorite piece is not the one that I conduct now and then. It's that one that I've been able to do again, a couple of times and I would long for that. So now I could you know, be stubborn and say, I want to conduct my favorite piece of music. Otherwise, I'm not going to be happy. Well, I have to wait another 20 years, probably. Or if I was to program a concert of my favorite pieces, I bet nobody would come. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. It's very possible. So, and this was a member of the orchestra? Yes. What instrument or what age? Or uh, what, uh... David is, is, is in, uh, David is not in my group. Okay. And, uh, so I'm going to have to confess. I, I recognize his face, but I can't mm -hmm. tell you. Oh, no, no, no. Which group he's in right now. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Just to have a sense uh, where we are. But I also want to take this opportunity for your members or for the parents that are, that may be listening in. But is thank you to the parents. We always have to thank our parents for putting us through the path of music. That's not a given either. And also parents, if you, if you have never been told how much we appreciate your efforts, now I'm telling you on behalf of everybody, because sometimes we are immersed in so many things, but music is something that also doesn't happen on its own. If you don't have that support, and sometimes it is as simple as getting the green light from the parents, sure, do that. Even if the school offers something, many times the parents would not necessarily know that there's either a benefit or what it might be about. So I always tell parents the story about baseball. I got into baseball, why couldn't your kids go into the mariachi group? And actually they end up in the mariachi group. It's cool because it's that same thing. The fact that you don't know more about this, well, I didn't know about baseball and I go to every, I've sat through practices and practices and practices, sometimes with a score in my, my hand while trying to catch up stuff. But let, let, let's face it, babes, baseball is not that fast of a game, right? Compared to soccer or tennis, if you blink, you missed it all the time. So yes, thank you parents for, for your encouragement and, and devotion and support to the kids. And thank you, Miguel, for taking the time to spend time with us today. I wanna correct the record and say that David Escamilla is an eighth grade violinist in Yosu Capriccio's ah. strings. I thought he was a violinist, but honestly, I didn't wanna say it out loud and be wrong. Yes, um, yes this is uh, my, my, like my youngest daughter, eighth grader violinist, I totally get it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, okay. we are so grateful to you for taking the time today. And thank you not only for speaking with us today, but for all you do in your career to support young conductors and for all you do to diversify the repertoire of orchestras. We didn't even really talk much today about right. Camino, Camino yes. Salinka. Oh, all, right. all the great work you've done with uh, bringing repertoire into the lives of U.S. orchestras that they aren't always exploring otherwise. And Thank so you. And, and one last thing, Troy, that I just thought about when I'm talking to parents, and also for you to know that, and you probably know this because of our previous email exchange, is that all the programs that I do teaching-wise, all of them have financial aid available, all of them, because that was my own condition to myself. Because in a lab orchestra, it's the most expensive instrument. It's made out of you know, 80, 50, 40 individuals. So, and to do it right is not as simple or, or cheap, let's put it that way. But I've been able to have a group of people that have helped me create a scholarship fund. It's a financial aid fund because it could be applied to many, many things early enough. And I'm very happy for that. So don't ever think that if writing me an email or, or applying. Also, all the applications to my programs cost nothing. Application fee, none. Even at the University of Nebraska, when I said one of the conditions for me to get there is that no application fee. Because these days you apply to 10 programs, that's over a thousand dollars. I mean, wh wh what are we thinking? So anyway, I want to make sure that there's never a reason 
why somebody couldn't write me or ask me a question about anything that has to do with the future of music. Thank you so much, Maestro. We really are grateful for you for your time. Um, thanks to everybody who tuned in. We were very happy to have you with us. And uh, we are looking forward to inviting you all back every Sunday through the end of July. We're going to be having more presentations in this series of Yosa Live Chats. Please make sure that you join us next week when we'll be joined by cellist Christine Lamprea, who is an alum and a wonderful cello soloist and chamber musician. And uh, composer Kenji Bunch coming up the week after that. We have Ooh. lots and lots of great guest artists coming up. And so we'll look forward to seeing all of you back again next week. Thanks.